Welcome to Understanding the Word of God. This channel is dedicated to understanding the Bible one verse at a time. Today's Bible verse is Galatians chapter 5, verse 23. Gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. So today we're going to focus on the word self-control and see is this something that we do through our own strength or is this something that, that is done through through God? Should it be more con more called uh, God control or spirit control or should it be self-control, will control or by my own strength control? So let's look up the word in the Bible concordance. So we'll go to uh, the blue letter Bible and I've already typed in the verse and clicked on the uh, the word self-control. So self-control as far as the the Bible usage, it's the virtue of one who masters his desires and passions, especially his sensual appetites. So this covers uh, pretty much everything that's that's natural, the natural man, from just the, the normal desires we have to the passions, and we become a master over those. The question is, is do we become a master over them like we see in the... the uh, the self-discipline uh, religions of life that work on trying to control every aspect of their life and they isolate themselves from society and they then practice uh, different physical forms of movement and they try to uh, control their desires and passions through isolation and through repetition of practicing a certain uh, behaviors. Is that what it's saying here that we're to do? Or is there something more to it than just that? Are we to live our lives as just being a master over this? Or is there a, a relationship that's supposed to come about, come apart, come about through this? So this kind of takes me to Romans 8, 13. It says, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So if we look at the sensual appetites, the sensual appetites, to me those would relate a lot to the deeds of the body. And here it says, it's by the Spirit we put to death the deeds of the body, and you will live. Mastering the deeds of the body through the Spirit is the way to walk in this life. So we're not fulfilling the desires of the flesh, which is described here in, in the definition of self-control. Uh, your personal desires and passions and sensual appetites. So let's read Romans 8, 13 again. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. According to this verse, it's by the Spirit we put to death the deeds of the body. It comes back to the, the question that I see continual through the scriptures is how then do we live according to the spirit or how do we by the spirit put the death of deeds of the body to be able to determine whether it's god's spirit or whether it's the worldly spirit we need to have a plumb line to be able to see that a plumb line was used or is still used to determine whether a beam is vertical or not because when you use it as a structural support it needs to be vertical because it can bear more weight if it's vertical versus if it's curved it's going to have a tendency to to continue in that curve in that direction that it's facing so the plumb line to use would be how did jesus live what did he say what did he do the book of acts what did the book of acts show us how the disciples lived and what about the letters to the churches that were written by the apostles these are all things that can be used as a plumb line if there's something that we're not sure we should do 
if we're spending time in God's Word, then it's gonna we're gonna have a, an insight in in which way we're to walk. So how then do I submit the deeds of the body? So we know that the spirit we need to ask God. For it says in Luke, it says that how much more will He give the Spirit to those that ask? And that's how we receive God's Spirit. But then what do we do when we get that strong desire for sensual expression or our own passions, our own uh, things that we want to do in life? How do, we, how do we not live according to those? It's basically by a, a repentant heart. A repentant heart is one that will choose to change the direction you're going. So when I have that desire, I can cry out and ask God to free me from it. Psalms 45 verse 7 says, You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. The, the key with our essential desires is to hate wickedness. As we hate the wickedness in us, and the way you hate, there's de if you look up the definition of hate, there's some interesting observations about it. One aspect of hating someone is just to ignore them, is not to talk to them. That is a that's that's also a level of hate. It's not the emotional raging that we usually associate with the word hate. But hate can be as simple as just. Well, I'm not, I'm, I'm going to ignore you. I don't have, want to have anything to do with you. And so we can turn to God and say, God, I, I choose to reject this lust and then I'm going to turn to you and I want to love your righteousness. So we know that if we love righteousness and hate wickedness, therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And the oil of gladness is the essential piece of living in this world because we can have happiness which is very situational it's very difficult to to go beyond uh, a level of of joy if if we're living our lives based on happiness and happiness is totally circumstantial it's it's where if things go right I can be happy in other words, if I marry the right person, if I have the right job, if I live in the right neighborhood, if uh, I don't get in an accident, as soon as we start veering off of any of those things, as soon as I start thinking, well, I married the wrong person, our happiness is gone. As soon as I think I'm working in the wrong job, our happiness is gone. If I think I'm living in the wrong neighborhood, my happiness is gone. So happiness is very situational. It, it's based upon the different things that we're going to judge as whether that's what we want or not want. So it comes down to, well, what is it that I want? And if I have what I want, then I can be happy. Well, if I don't have what I want, then I can be happy. Versus the oil of gladness goes way beyond that. It's, it's an aspect of joy, which is this phenomenal. Uh, there's, there's examples of it in the Bible that just are, to me, are mind-blowing. When Paul and Silas were arrested and they were beaten and they were thrown in prison in stocks, which basically, from my understanding, is that they were they were totally they couldn't move their head, their hands, or their or their feet. They were they were totally stationary. Then they had wounds that were that were oozing, and then all of a sudden they start praising and singing God in the middle of the night. And when they did that. An earthquake shook the prison and they opened up and their stocks and stuff and then they were they were free and then the the guards of the prison came and tended their wounds I mean it's phenomenal that they were able to do that that to me that's an example of, of an extreme example of joy that goes beyond situational circumstances I can't think of anybody who has practiced being happy would continue being happy in that situation so they weren't happy. They definitely had a supernatural experience with joy. And that's what it says here, that if we love righteousness and hate wickedness, God will anoint us with the oil of gladness. 
And so that oil of gladness, that joy can override all of the limitations that come from being just happy because happy is a very limited emotion. The subject of righteousness. Looking to try to get more information on that, I did a quick internet search on the word righteousness and I saw this website, uh, Act of Christianity, 29 eye-opening Bible verses about righteousness. So what does the Bible actually say about righteousness? This is this is important because we need to know what the scriptures say about righteousness. So I could do a search myself. There's 558 times in the Bible so we can see it's an extremely important, important matter. Here we've gathered together just 29 verses about righteousness and give a bit and a glimpse into God's thoughts about the topic. So let's let's look at these 29 verses and see how these verses can give us a direction on how to walk in God's righteousness. So righteousness is something God wants from us. So these Bible verses prove that we should be actively pursuing righteousness in our life. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Micah 6, 8. Do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Proverbs 21, 3. So many times I've thought, I need to give something up to be able to serve God. And here it's saying to do righteous and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. So we we kind of get, times we can get off track thinking that, well, if I just, I got to give something up, I got to give something up. Well, obviously there are times we have to give things up. I mean, I need to give up my sensual, sensual uh, passions and some of my desires and wants, but... But if it's just a sacrifice, and I constantly come to God with just a sacrifice, and I don't know what His righteousness and justice is, then I'm not actually uh, doing the better of the two. Let's go on to the next verse here. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, verses 19 through 20. This is another one of those verses that just, uh, to me, it just, it's so mind-blowing. Here you had the, the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes wrote down all the scriptures. So, so they knew the scriptures. They, they knew about loving God first with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and, and love your neighbors yourself. They, they knew all this stuff, and the Pharisees, they knew it. But for some reason, they were, they were not capable of living it. They didn't, they didn't understand God's righteousness. Let's go on to the next verse. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, or correction, for instruction in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3.16 The next verse, thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord, your God, who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way you should go. Oh, that you had heeded my commandments. Then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Isaiah 48, 17 and 18. This is just so awesome in the sense to where he will lead us in the way we should go. And if we heed his commandments, then our peace will be like a river and our righteousness like the waves of the sea. Righteousness is something we must practice. The Bible verse showing that righteousness is an action that by faith should come forth in our day-to-day -day lives. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. 1 John 2.29 Flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, and with those who are called on the Lord out of a pure heart. 2 Timothy 2.22 so This kind of ties into our, our verses. Flee youth, youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, and those who are called of the Lord out of a pure heart. The Society has become so 
focused on, on me, myself, and I. I remember there was a book that came out back then about pursuing uh, your own self-interest. And my, my neighbor, who had been married, I was a, just a, a teenager at the time, still living at home, and my neighbor had gotten hold of the, the book about me, myself, and I. I. forget the exact title of it, but that's basically what the concept was, is everything for myself. And, and he uh, left his wife of 25 years and just went and pursued what he wanted, and he just abandoned his family. And it's, it's interesting to see that when we do spend our time sowing to our lust, we don't pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace. And we need to call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And we can't do that if our, if our focus is on lust. And our society has, has really worked really a lot to get to where lust become the, the number one focus and goal of everyone. It's like, well, what do I want? You know, whatever I want, that's, that trumps everything else. But we should be letting uh, righteousness, faith, love, and peace trump our youthful lust. Going on to the next verse. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Revelations 19, 7 through 8. This is really interesting. I That when we do practice righteousness, which I believe comes through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we then will be clothed with this fine linen, the righteous acts of the saints. Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God, being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God, Romans 6.13. So the life from the dead is the life that we live in the Spirit. And the life of sin is a life that we live in opposition to God's righteousness. And having been set free from sin, we became slaves of righteousness, Romans 6.18. And that's a, just a really wonderful way to see it. In other words, if we're consumed by our natural passions and desires and, and, and wants and lust, we can become free from them. We can become free from these disobedient acts and we can become slaves of righteousness which then makes it so much easier doing righteousness when you're not. Because <laughs> if you're a slave to sin, you can't do righteousness. And so if you become a slave of righteousness, then you can get free from sin. In this, the children of God, the children of the devil are manifest. They who do not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. 1 John 3.16 Yeah, 1 John is just, you can read that epistle over and over and over again. There's so much insight in there about loving and righteousness and, and the way to walk in this life. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Acts 10, 34-35. This is pretty awesome, is that up until this time, all the disciples that followed Jesus were all Jewish. The whole promise of Jesus coming was promised to the Jewish nation. And there's also um, comments throughout the, uh, the writing of the, the prophets and stuff saying that he was going to be a, a savior of the, of the whole world, but it didn't, it didn't, it didn't really, those were kind of uh, obscure and, and they weren't real common throughout the, uh, the entire books of the Old Testament. So as we go forward here and we see the disciples are basically working with just the Jewish people. And then, and then Peter gets his vision and says, No, look, I've, uh, I've also included the Gentiles into the, uh, the church of God. And so as we see here, it says that if we fear him and work righteousness, we'll be accepted by him. And that was Peter's de declaration, is that he would accept anyone who feared God and worked righteousness, even if they were non-Jewish at the time. And then we come down to 1 Corinthians 15, 34 is, is pretty awesome too. It says, Awake to righteousness and do not sin, 
for some of you have do not have the knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. So here, God is also even reaching out to the Corinthians, which didn't know God, and nor were they righteous, nor were they fearing God, and he's and they're being told to wake to righteousness and do not sin. So they're being actually in their sin, they're actually being called forth for, to come out of that sin. So it, you see the transition here? First, the transition was that, hey, look, God will honor Gentiles that work righteousness and that fear him. And then it went on to the next point to where, you know, to one of the most debased cities of that time is Corinthians. Some of the practices they were doing were just appalling. And here's God speaking to them saying, Awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some of you have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So this is then a, an also a direction to people that do have the knowledge of God that we need to share that with the others that don't have the knowledge of God. And we come here to the next uh, verse. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Titus 2 verses Chapter 2, verse 12. So here's another verse that kind of ties right into what we were talking about, the self-control. That we need to deny ungodliness, ungodliness and worldly lust. And here it says, righteousness is something that we can increase in. The more we practice righteousness and pursue it, the greater our righteousness will be, as these Bible verses show. It says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Matthew 5, 6. And if we don't have any hunger for God's righteousness, how do we get it? I mean, this is this is a, a, a very compelling thing that we need to do as believers. If you're a believer and you have no hunger for righteousness, your your faith is in danger. It's severe, you're you're walking in to a, an area that could just uh, you could easily be swept away by the influence of the world, and we don't want to be swept away by the influence of the world. One way I find to increase righteousness is to find believers that are working towards being righteous. It's, it's like that in anything we pursue. If we are pursuing any subject, if I want to learn how to repair a car, I'm going to get with people that know how to repair cars. Or if I want to learn how to garden, I'm going to get with people that are, that are gardening. Any subject that we want to become proficient in, if we get around people that are doing it, then they can become proficient in it. And the same thing with righteousness. If, if I have no desire for righteousness, is it because I'm isolated myself from the body of believers? Have I isolated myself from God's word? Have I isolated myself from people that, that teach God's word? Have I isolated myself from doing acts of righteousness? So there's a lot of different ways that we can begin to work to try to to stir up that flame within us to where we can desire righteousness again and have we sinned and we, and we feel rejected of god rejection is probably one of the the biggest tools that the enemy likes to use to tell us that we can't walk in god's righteousness but we can by simply repenting and asking him if i've sinned and it doesn't matter what the sin was, I can still repent and ask God for forgiveness and to teach me to walk in righteousness so I don't continue to sin. Because the most disheartening thing in the world is, is to choose to be a believer and start following after God and find that all we do is we're still just living after the flesh and we realize that we're just breaking His commands one after another. But through His work of His Spirit, He can begin to teach us and change us and take us from the, uh, the brokenness that we have in our life to... Uh, fulfilling relationship with him. As it says in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18, but the path of the just is like a shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. And that's what God does is that when we take this path of righteousness, it just it's like there's just more and more light that comes into our lives. Says, do you not know that whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are the are that one slave to whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. Romans six sixteen. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food 
Supply and multiply your seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. 2 Corinthians 9, verses 10. And this is 2 Corinthians, verses where we saw the verse in 1 Corinthians, where they were being told that they didn't even know God. And now here, they're being told that God is supplying the seed to the sower and bread for food and supply and multiply the seeds you have sown and increase your fruits of righteousness. So there again, you can come out of a totally debased, godless, self-centered, happy-based society to something that is just full of God's righteousness and it can even increase. If the Corinthians can do it, I'm feeling that we can do it too. So the results of righteousness. The Bible verses show the tremendous outcome that we can experience when we pursue righteousness. Benefits for now and for eternity. It said blessings are on the head of the righteous. The memory of the righteous is blessed. The mouth of the righteous is a well of life. But the righteous has an everlasting foundation. The verses are found in Proverbs. Therefore do not worry saying what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? After all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 33. Then righteousness will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Matthew 13, 43. The works of righteousness will be peace, and the effects of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. Isaiah 32 verse 17 and these will go away into everlasting punishment but their righteousness into eternal life Matthew 25 46 you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness therefore God your God has appointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions Hebrews 1 9 so here's the verse that we had read in in the Psalms is being repeated here in Hebrews 1 9 so this is a when something's repeated I think it even has more significance than when something stated one time it says for you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness therefore God your God has appointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions and this lawlessness is is basically where we just choose to do whatever we want whatever we feel like whenever we whenever we feel like it and God's righteousness has direction, guidance, help. Just all It's so much better than just living after the passions of the moment. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all those who love his appearing. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. So here's the, the end result of a righteous life. We receive an eternity, we get to get into heaven, and not only do we get into heaven, but we get a crown of righteousness, which God will give us, for he's a righteous judge. And here's some other verses about righteousness to ins inspire us and to, to be able to pursue and practice righteousness daily. daily. <clears throat> your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Hebrews 1.8 And be found of him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Philippians 3.9 For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Romans 14, verse 17 Stand therefore, having gird your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Ephesians 6, 14. So if this collection of Bible verses about righteousness inspired you, you may be interested in reading more on our topic page about righteousness or in the following selected articles. So I'll put a link to this uh, website in my comment section and you can go continue to Look into more of the, the topics they have on righteousness. They got righteousness and investment with incredible long term results. What does God want from me? So these scriptures are taken from the New King James Version. So we uh, want to just thank God for his instructions, for his words, for his teaching. That we can 
basically come to the point where it says in Galatians, gentleness, self-control such, against such there is no law, that we can live a life of self-control, one that is, that is in union and in fellowship with God. So Father, we thank you that we can seek you at this time and that we did seek you through your word, that you'll continue to speak to us and lead us and guide us by your spirit. For we know that if we try to live righteously of our own desires and our own flesh, that we're not going to be successful. But, but if we can live a life that's being led by your spirit, for you said that you will give your spirit to those that ask. And we just ask for the gift of your spirit to help us live this righteous life. Help us be able to turn from the sin. Help us no longer be a slave to sin, but be a slave to righteousness. Let your word settle within us and transform us and change us. That we might be transformed by the, by the power of your word and the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.